So guys, here we are back on the 2007 Legacy GT, 200,000 plus miles. I did not want to film this as a step-by-step -step DIY repair video style video because most of the things I'm doing here I've covered in several videos in the past and it'd just be remaking the same old video over and over again. Uh, one I did not do or have not done is the cam cover gasket cam cover reseal for the EJ255. I have not made that video before and unfortunately I didn't make it here, but I'll talk you through it. It's extremely easy to do. Now, what we have done so far, as you can see, we've got a lot of stuff disassembled right now. Yesterday I came here and I went ahead and pulled the old timing set, old water pump, pulled the oil cooler, put a new oil cooler o-ring, thoroughly cleaned the oil cooler as it was gross and disgusting and covered in years of buildup of leaking oil and dirt and crud. Got all the new timing set in last night, have not done the check spin and pulled the grenade pin there on the tensioner. And I went ahead and did the reseal on both cam covers. Now again, we'll go into that in more detail. So guys, if you remember back to the inspection video, this power steering rack was replaced by the dealership and fasteners were missing. Uh, I've gone ahead and reinstalled or installed the bolts for the steering rack for the bolts that they had missing. I'm still pretty leery about this bolt. I don't believe that is the factory bolt from Subaru. I think all of them should be these 14 millimeter headed bolts. Uh, but it's in there and it's tight, so I'm gonna leave it for now. Uh, but otherwise, pretty sure it's supposed to be a 14 millimeter headed bolt. Uh, dealerships, guys, they're not always your best bet for good repair work. So the cam covers on this EJ255 in this 2005 to 2009 chassis legacy look like they could be difficult or intimidating, but they're actually very easy to do. The most difficult thing for me was removing the breather hoses here on the top of the cam cover because they were just so hard and stuck so fast to the uh, nipples there at the top of the cam cover. But basically all you wanna do is the same as if you were doing a spark plug replacement. Uh, you see I've got a ton of stuff out of the way, but that's because I'm doing multiple services at once. All that is not necessary for the cam cover. Now what really needs to be removed for the cam cover gaskets on this vehicle would be take out the air box and the intake track between here and the air box. I loosened up the coolant reservoir and pulled it up. I don't think I actually need to do that. I don't think I needed any more clearance from it. I mainly moved that just so I could get more leverage to pull up the two breather hoses there on the cam cover. Now you do have a click clamp here on this uh, rear hose. Subaru started using those in the mid 2000s. So you will need a clip, click clamp pair of pliers or you can break them off and put a worm gear plier, uh, worm gear clamp back on there, but it's, might as well just, uh, you know, put it back the way it was. Other than that, you need to remove the two 12 millimeter headed bolts that hold in your ignition coil, same as if you were replacing the spark plugs. You've got a little push in grommet here and here that hold the wiring harness in place, uh, but you take the two ignition coils loose, pull them out, leave the harness attached, and then you can just flip it up here on top. That gets your wiring out of the way and it gets both coils out of the way. Now your oxygen sensor there, or air fuel ratio sensor, whichever you wanna call it, it has a hold down bracket on the 12 millimeter bolt for the ignition coil. It'll just pop off and you can push it down and back. And then aside from that, that's basically it. You've got 10 millimeter headed fasteners You've got three on the front here, one, two, and three. You've got one here, one directly below that. You've got one here that holds this bracket, one there, and then one in the bottom corner. Now that one in the bottom corner is a pain to get at. You cannot get on it with a ratchet and a socket. 
even me with like the specialized tools I have, you can't. So what I ended up using was a Acai Light Tool 1012 uh, offset wrench. I'll show you that in a minute, but I had to use that on both corners. Once that's out of the way, you basically can lightly pry right here in this gap to break the RTV seal. There is a little bit of RTV in certain areas. I'll put a diagram up on the screen. You do need to put a little bit of RTV in there and let it cure for 24 hours. Uh, but other than that, that's basically all you gotta do. Pop it loose and it comes right back up and uh, you know, there's nothing really in the way. You don't have to jack up the engine, tilt the engine in any way to get out the passenger side cover. Clean all the mating surface thoroughly, remove the old RTV, apply new RTV, your new gasket, your new uh, spark plug tube O-rings, the seals in the middle, and uh, put it back in there, tighten everything back down, and you're good to go on the passenger side. So moving on to the driver side cam cover. This one's a little bit more involved, a little more aggravating. So what you'll want to do is take your wiring harness. This is the main harness here. It normally goes this way, and it's the harness for your AC compressor clutch, your alternator, and your air pump. You want to remove your air pump. Uh, two 12 millimeter headed bolts here. You'll have a hose clamp here with a flat duct and a 10 millimeter headed bolt here that holds that duct in place. So there's a clamp down there, a clamp up here, 10 millimeter headed bolt. You can get the duct out, those two 12s there, and one electrical connector, and you can get the air pump out. Once that's out of the way, take the wiring harness, pull it back through, and tuck it over here. Now, from there, you've got the same situation. Two ignition coils, you need to pull them out with the harness, flip them back over somewhere in this area and you've got two breather hoses here on top of the cam cover to take loose and push back out of the way. Now again you have three 10 millimeter headed bolts one two three on the front you've got one here in the middle one at the bottom there and you've got three at the back here you've got one here one here one just behind here and you got one down there in the bottom corner now that one in the bottom corner is a problem child because you cannot remove it with the engine as it sits. Uh, if you get it all the way loose, it will hit the cross member and you can't pull it out from the cam cover. So what you have to do is go underneath the car and loosen the two 14 millimeter nuts on the bottom of the engine mounts, which are these guys right here. There's one. And there's your second one. You don't have to remove it completely. Just back the nut up all the way to the end of the thread there, and that's basically it. From there, you're gonna take a wooden block, put under your oil pan to dissipate load, take a floor jack, and lightly jack up the engine. You only need to bring it up a couple of inches. Be careful in doing this. If you do it wrong, if you don't have a block of wood in here, you can easily crush the bottom of your oil pan or deform it, cause a big nightmare, big issue where you have to take this oil pan off and replace it and likely your oil pickup. So don't go reefing on the jack and crush your oil pan. You will have bad times, but lightly jack up the engine. Again, only about an inch really. You're just picking out the slack and uh, taking out the slack in the studs for the motor mounts. You don't have to take the nut off completely. Just back it out to the end of the threads and jack it up till it stops. And then the cam cover will come out easy as pie. Here's a quick shot of the oil cooler with the new proper Tokyo Roki EJ engine oil filter. Much better than it looked uh, when we first did the inspection where it was uh, just covered in engine oil and grime. It's nice and shiny and clean now with a new O-ring. So yeah, once you get the engine jacked up, that cam cover will come right out, same as the passenger side. Again, you've got an area of RTV. You need to lay a bead at the front, and you've got two areas at the back where the little half moon seals are for the backs of the camshafts. You need to put a little bit of RTV across those half moons 
and cover up the uh, place where the seal meets the head. Other than that, you just pop it back in and reinstall your bolts. Uh, the tightening pattern I'll put up on the screen, basically go front, back, middle, top, middle, bottom, and then X your corners, and that's it. Now, these are shouldered bolts. They do have a torque specification, but honestly, you don't really need to torque them. Being that it's a shouldered bolt, you just tighten it up till you feel resistance till it stops. Because of it having that shoulder, that's basically as far as you can tighten it. If you tighten it further than the shoulder, you'll start to pull threads and strip them. They're very small and they're in aluminum and it's very easy to strip them out and you don't wanna be having to pull cam carriers or the cylinder heads to repair damaged threads for these cam covers. So what do I mean by a shouldered bolt? Just to give you a visual, this is what we call a shouldered bolt. You see how it has this sleeve and then it's got a shoulder before the threads taper, uh, well, the whole bolt tapers down to the threaded section. So basically this round dowel section centers in the hole for the cam cover. And all you're doing is tightening until your threads hit the uh, cam carrier or the cylinder head right here at this shouldered flat spot. If you turn much more than that, you're gonna start pulling those threads with this steel bolt through the aluminum uh, in the engine. Uh, compared to a normal bolt where you got a big flat washer on it, honestly, it's kind of the same deal. It's just uh, that you have the shoulder down here instead of under the head of the bolt or under the washer. So just be wary of that. Again, there is a torque specification, but I have seen people, uh, myself included, have uh, torqued shouldered bolts and uh, actually started damaging the threads before the specified torque was reached. So basically just snug them up till they stop. And, uh, you know, it comes down to uh, doing this kind of work and having a feel for when something is tight enough and when it is about to damage. More on dealer work. Remember I said that the power steering pump had been replaced in this car several times as well. And this is an aftermarket pump. As you can see, it's painted black. A Subaru Genuine pump would be bare aluminum. Now, it is a common issue on Subaru EJs that people damage the threads installing and removing the power steering pump bracket. Uh, but if we look right here, there should be 12 millimeter headed bolts, one, two, and three for the power steering pump bracket. Uh, but I couldn't get this one to come out and I was like, well, what's going on here? And I looked with my mirror and saw it was a 10 millimeter headed bolt. And looking at the bolt and working on GM products in the past and Chrysler products in the past, it looks like a uh, Chrysler product 10 millimeter headed bolt, not even a Subaru one. I believe this car was worked at at a uh, Chrysler Jeep Dodge dealership for the power steering, if I recall correctly. And as you see here, they have completely boogered up the threads, removed the threads, destroyed the threads, stripped the threads for the one of the three power steering pump bolts. So I'm gonna get the timing cover back on, get that finished up, and then I'm gonna put a thread cert in here, or a time cert here, and uh, fix the threads and put the proper bolt back in so this is repaired correctly, rather than them just jamming a 10 millimeter headed bolt in there to try to cut their own threads. Uh, but we're gonna do that after I get the timing cover on just so we don't have aluminum shavings and stuff in here to uh, clean up after we've got all the nice, shiny, new timing components in here. And we'll talk about the timing belt and the timing components here shortly. Got it all on, everything is aligned, everything is ready to go. We got to pull the tensioner. We've got to uh, do the check spin, check rotation, make sure everything still lines up, but as many of these as I've done, it's bang on. We just got to pull the pin and go. Uh, but you always want to check, no matter how many times you've done it, there's always that chance that you could have screwed something up. I'm not exempt from that. So I will be doing a chest rotation. You rotate the crankshaft two times, make sure all the lines align. Now I've had this question in the past. Your timing belt marks will not line back up. It takes something like 174 revolutions before these lines line back up. 
uh, you're just gonna check your marks. So your notch in the oil pump and your notch in the can, uh, crank sprocket and your notches in your cam pulleys and cam cover and your double lines between the cam covers and your lines here. That's what you wanna align after a test spin. After you move the crank, after you crank the rotate, uh, after you crank the engine a rotation, these lines are no longer of any consequence. They are literally there just to help you align everything when you first install it. After that, after the engine spun, no hope of those lining up again. I mean, eventually they will line up, but you're not gonna sit here and crank that thing over until all those lines line back up. So guys, while we've been talking about the timing set and looking at the new stuff, let's take a look at what I pulled off of this vehicle. Being it has 200,000 miles on it, it's had at least one timing service done as you expect to do it every 80 to 100,000 mile range. Now, everything I pulled off of here was OE Subaru factory stuff. So likely a Subaru dealership did the last timing set on this vehicle. And we see here we've got a Japanese Fuji genuine Yamada water pump. Yamada started making the water pumps on the later EJs, or perhaps they made them on all of them, I'm not exactly sure. Just the later models were stamped Yamada and the older ones were not. Now, it looks like this water pump was manufactured September the 12th, or September 25th of 2012. This is a 2007 year model vehicle. So likely they got a lot of mileage on it very quickly. And then uh, the last 10 years, it's been uh, driven a little bit less. Now that is the date of manufacture for the water pump. That doesn't necessarily mean that September 25th, 2012 was when this was all replaced. It could have been 13, 14, 15. This thing could have been sitting on the shelf for quite a while. But anyway, we've got some corrosion on our nipples, all three of them actually. Uh, so likely the cooling system was neglected and was not replaced at the proper three year, 36,000 mile interval. This vehicle does have green conventional coolant in it. Uh, I've completely pulled everything out of it. Being an 07, 07, 08 was about when the uh, blue super coolant came out. We are gonna refill this car with the blue super coolant, which allows for uh, Subaru says 10 year, 100,000 mile service, but I recommend 880, eight year, 80,000 miles, uh, because some of those very extended service intervals are just too extended, in my opinion. Whether I'm right or wrong on it, I'd rather change it early and often than uh, too late and have corrosion and issues with your cooling system. Now, looking at the impeller on the pump, everything here is nice and clean and everything looks good and the bearing sounds good in it as well, no roughness. Now, looking at our timing belt itself, this is a Subaru Genuine belt. And if I look around here, I can find it. Uh, right here, I don't know if this will show up on camera or not, but you can just barely make out the blue Subaru font and writing. Now, the writing on these belts normally lasts somewhere between uh, 80 to 100,000 miles. Normally, if you pull off the timing cover and you cannot find any of the timing marks, any writing anywhere on the belt, it's time to replace it. That's just a good general rule of thumb. Normally you can see the writing fairly well up until the point where it's got mileage on it, age on it to the point where it's time to replace it. Now this one is not that bad. It is in good condition. There's not a bunch of cracks on it, stress cracks, spider webbing, anything like that. Uh, there's no fraying of the belt and there's no separation of the belt. It's still in very good condition, but based on just the text and the fact that we don't know the age of the timing set, we can roughly guesstimate with 200,000 miles, it was replaced 100,000 miles ago, so it's due for another timing set. So that's why we went ahead and replaced it. Looking at the tensioner, now this is a genuine Japanese NTN tensioner, and we can see the tensioner was leaking hydraulic fluid, which is fairly common on this style of tensioner on Subaru timing sets. We have an original NSK bearing here, the cogged bearing. When one fails, this is normally the one that fails. 
Uh, normally on Subarus, when you have a timing failure, rarely do I see the belt itself break. Normally it is someone has replaced the belt and gone the cheap route and not replaced all the components and these bearings give out. They seize up and then they shred your belt. Normally it's this cog pulley by the water pump that blows up. Other than that, our, our double roller is a genuine Koyo. Uh, still sounds fairly good. This has the old outdated NSK single bearing roller on the bottom and it did have quite a bit of play in it and it is very rough sounding. I don't know if I'll be able to spin it one handed and get it to come through on the camera. Uh, but the good thing about the Ison kit is it gives you two of these double bearing rollers to replace that old single bearing lower royal ro ro <laughs> tongue twister guys because more bearing more better. And as we can see here on the vehicle, we've got now two of the black Koyo double roller bearing pulleys. A lot more stout than that single roller. So guys, our box of new parts is getting very slim. All we really have left are air filter, engine air filter, cabin air filter, a coolant hose off the back of the reservoir there. We've got the PCV valve, the PCV valve holder, and the PCV valve hoses associated with it, uh, a set of front brake pads, and two new front shocks for our strut assembly. And aside from that, we're basically done. On the rear, we did new brake pads. We did new uh, rear upper links. I'll get those out in a minute from the scrap metal pile and show you how bad they were. And we did rear shocks for the rear struts. Also on the front of this vehicle, went ahead and did new sway bar end links there. I'll get those out and show you how bad they were. So over at the scrap metal pile, uh, these are the old front sway bar end links. All the boots were busted and they had quite a bit of movement, quite a bit of play in the spherical joint and likely were causing some bumping and some noise. So no good there. I uh, can't remember where the rear brake pads are for this specific legacy. Uh, but these are the rear upper links. And if you recall to that first video we saw, the inspection video, we saw these bushings were bad, failing on the ends of the rear upper link. Uh, this one we could see and look like the worst one, but in actuality, the passenger side rear upper link was worse because if you look at the bushing here, it's completely torn through all the way around. And I can actually push out that center eyelet. So don't neglect to check your suspension bushings when doing a suspension inspection. Check those eyelets, check those bushings. Look at your trailing arm bushings, your control arm bushings. This rubber doesn't last forever, guys, uh, especially rear differential bushings. Those are one thing I always see overlooked just due to the uh, aggravation and complexity and cost and labor to replace those bushings. It's not an easy job. Uh, the lowers looked okay, but both uppers were just trashed and uh, they're here in the scrap metal pile. And, uh, oh, these are the rear shocks. So, guys, just because a rear shock is not leaking, it's not wet, doesn't mean it's bad. Because these are the original KYB Subaru struts. As you see, I just compressed that very easily by hand, and there is no rebound whatsoever. You look right here at the bottom. Subaru part number. These are likely the factory 2007 rear shocks with 200,000 miles on them. So guys, again, when you inspect this stuff, age plays a part in it. Just because it's not leaking, just because it doesn't look like it has failed, doesn't mean they haven't failed. Shocks should be replaced every 60,000 miles or so. That's an average rule of thumb for shock absorber life. So again, Check it out, there's nothing left here. There's absolutely no shock, no dampening left in these shocks. They are completely shot shocks. All right, so we got the intercooler off and we've removed the PCV valve 
and uh, man, it was really stuck in there. I don't think it's ever been replaced. No shaky shaky. Probably why there's so many oil leaks on this engine. All the hoses, super hard, super brittle compared to the new stuff that's super springy. Uh, the main PCV hose split in several places when I took it off. It's just so brittle. Uh, the plastic or the rubber is just uh, cracking. So got all brand new components here. Uh, the plastic housing actually shattered when I tried to remove the old PCV valve. I had to use my Milwaukee high torque. Finally got it out. So we got a new PCV valve, new plastic piece here. We've got a new hose to the bottom. We've got the new hose here. And uh, get that all put back on, put the intercooler back on. Already got the timing cover back on and everything at the front. All right, guys, all the PCV components have been replaced along with this swollen uh, coolant hose that goes from the turbo to the turbo coolant reservoir. All that's in nice and neat. Reinstall the intercooler and uh, throw the radiator back in. So this project's basically complete. Still got to do front brakes and shocks. But other than that, we're pretty much there. So with that said, thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one.